distingués invités, Monsieur l'ex-professeur, ex-ministre, ex-juge Marx, bienvenue à la deuxième conférence Chevrette Marx. Avant de laisser la parole à mon jeune et brillant collègue Anne Rouzou, qui procédera à une présentation plus formelle de nos conférenciers invités, j'aimerais dire quelques mots à leur sujet, puisque j'ai le privilège de les compter parmi mes amis. Par égard envers le professeur John Burroughs, qui se désole de ne pas parler le français comme je me désole de ne pas parler la Nishinabek, je m'exprimerai en partie en anglais. Last week, along with some law students from Osgoode Hall Law School, I spent four days in John's home community, the Cape Crocker Indian Reserve, situated in southern Ontario on the shore of the Georgian Bay. The community, including John's family, generously received us for an initiation into the tenets of Anishinaabe law. Ceremonies around the sacred fire, forays into the bush, conversations with elders, young and old, I should underline, and our own involvement in discussions transformed what, for me at least, had basically been an intellectually abstract understanding of indigenous legal orders into one where such legal orders became synonymous with living practices embraced by contemporary indigenous communities. Practices designed to make sense of and to stabilize for the betterment of all concerned the multifarious relationships the community members weave in this messy world of ours. John and his daughter Lindsay, alongside others, opened the door to a legal system whose subtlety and richness, in terms of the normative answers that it provides, did not pale when compared to other legal systems and traditions, including Canada's common law and civil law traditions. A legal system composed of values, principles, rules, processes and actors that, as in all other legal systems, sustain and at the same time compete with one another. A system where abstractions and conceptualizations matter less than the relational dynamics for which they stand at, as metaphors. However subtle and rich these legal systems may be, they are not perfect, and, they are, and, they are, and nor are they, in absolute terms, better than others. They too have to deal with abuses of power and inequalities. John stands out as one of Canada's leading indigenous intellectuals, precisely because he cautiously refuses to be fascinated by the siren song of cultural essentialism that calls for the entrapment of both indigenous and non-indigenous peoples in the prison of monolithic identity. In this fashion, John reminds me of Kinu, a character whose story is related by John's late mentor and friend, Basil Johnston. Mr. Johnston was an elder from his community, a prominent Anishinaabe ethnologist and one of North America's most celebrated indigenous storytellers. Kinu was a renowned warrior who had spent his entire adult life as an outstanding fighter and leader. However, at the age of 50, he still had not attained his vision. During the summer of his 50th year, he received his vision in the course of a dream. He saw the peace pipe shining brightly as the enemies he had slain embraced his own warriors. He knew was profoundly disturbed. How could he, a man of war, morph into a man of peace? He knew that to do so would spark disbelief, mistrust, and the loss of friendships. He nonetheless remained true to his vision and finally succeeded in being accepted for what he truly was, a man of peace who did not shrink from conflict, but who also no longer wished to be a man of war. I believe that this vision is also John's, and that although the path of life is a tortuous one, he strongly intends to keep on going. I said earlier that however subtle and rich indigenous legal orders may be, they are not perfect, nor are they in absolute terms better than, our, than others. But what they truly are is this, 
they are deserving of attention. For more than a century, the Canadian state apparatus has focused on one and only one thing, the systematic destruction of the rules, processes, and actors embodying these legal traditions. But things are changing. Plusieurs Canadiens français, ce qu'on appelait tout simplement à l'époque les Canadiens, ont joué le rôle d'intermédiaire entre les peuples autochtones et les Européens, que ces derniers soient français ou anglais. Ces Canadiens, métissés par l'expérience, sont à l'origine des relations pacifiques qui ont été tissées entre autochtones et non autochtones. On les appelait alors en vieux français des truchements. Aujourd'hui, c'est par le truchement de la professeure André Boissel que de nouvelles générations d'étudiantes et d'étudiants d'Oscar Hall Law School sont initiés à l'ordre juridique Anishinaabe. André est à l'origine, en collaboration avec John, du camp auquel j'ai participé la semaine dernière. La mère de John me disait qu'elle aurait bien adopté André si la chose avait été possible. Le cercle aurait alors été parfait. From what I have just told you, you can measure the extent of my admiration and affection for both John and Henri. Although the high-tech surroundings of the Cyber Tribunal do not carry the poetry of the sound of leaves as they are being rustled by the wind blowing from the Georgian Bay, you will quickly notice that both speakers are the bearers of a sacred fire in heart and in soul, whatever meaning you wish to infuse in that concept. Je les remercie très sincèrement d'avoir accepté notre invitation et d'être ici aujourd'hui. J'invite maintenant Anne Roux à prendre la parole. Merci beaucoup. Monsieur Marx, euh, distingués invités, bon après-midi. Merci d'être présent en si grand nombre à cette deuxième conférence annuelle Chevrette Marx en droit constitutionnel. Mon nom est Anne Rouzou, je suis professeur en droit public à la Faculté de droit de l'Université de Montréal et le co-organisateur avec euh, mon estimé collègue Jean Leclerc euh, de cette conférence. Euh, il me fait très plaisir de vous présenter notre conférencier cette année euh, ainsi que sa euh, répondante. Le professeur John Burroughs est l'un des plus éminents professeurs et chercheurs au Canada en droit public et droit autochtone. Avant de se joindre à la Faculté de droit de l'Université de Victoria en 2014, il a été successivement professeur et titulaire de la chaire de recherche Robina en droit et société à l'Université de Minnesota Law School, professeur à la Osgood Hall Law School et aux universités de Colombie-Britannique et euh, York, ainsi que professeur invité à de nombreuses universités aux États-Unis, en Australie et en Nouvelle-Zélande. Il a aussi enseigné à Iqaluit au Nunavut, à l'École de droit Akitirak, un programme de formation juridique dirigé par euh, l'Université de Victoria. Depuis 2014, le professeur Burroughs est titulaire de la Chaire de recherche du Canada sur le droit autochtone à l'Université de Victoria. L'an dernier, il a été nommé titulaire de la Chaire Nexon en leadership autochtone au Banff Center for Arts and Creativity, un organisme canadien qui réunit artistes et chefs de file de tous les horizons et offre une gamme variée de programmes d'activités euh, multidisciplinaires. Le professeur Burroughs a été à l'avant-garde des initiatives en matière d'éducation juridique autochtone au Canada, ayant conçu des, prog des programmes de recherche et d'enseignement dans plusieurs universités. Il a enseigné à des centaines d'étudiants autochtones au Canada et offert une perspective juridique autochtone à des milliers d'étudiants non autochtones. John Burroughs est également un auteur prolifique et fréquemment cité par nos tribunaux. Ses recherches portent, entre autres, sur une meilleure intégration des traditions et pratiques juridiques autochtones dans le système juridique canadien. Soulignons notamment les ouvrages suivants. « Recovering Canada, the Resurgence of Indigenous Law », publié en 2002, qui a reçu le prix Donald Smiley, décerné par l'Association canadienne de sciences politiques. 
Canada's Indigenous Constitution, publié en 2010, qui a mérité le prix du meilleur ouvrage décerné par l'Association canadienne Droits et Société. Son plus récent ouvrage, publié cette année, est intitulé « Freedom and Indigenous Constitutionalism ». John Burroughs a reçu le prix du Conseil des peuples autochtones, la plus haute distinction de l'Association du barreau autochtone du Canada, ainsi que le prix national d'excellence décerné aux Autochtones dans le domaine du droit et de la justice. Il est membre de la Société royale du Canada et un lauréat de la Fondation Trudeau. John Burroughs est un Nashinabe Ojibwe et un membre de la Première Nation Chippewas de Nawash, en Ontario. Notre répondant est André Boissel, professeur à la Osgood Hall Law School de l'Université York, où elle enseigne le droit autochtone et travaille sur le développement de nouvelles offres de cours dans le domaine des traditions juridiques euh, autochtones. En 2014, elle a initié et organisé un camp de sensibilisation aux cultures autochtones à NEIH, une initiative destinée à initier les étudiants aux traditions juridiques autochtones. Le travail d'André Boissel dans le domaine du droit constitutionnel comparé cherche à revoir la conception de la théorie juridique occidentale en faisant dialoguer la conception du droit à l'œuvre dans le courant majoritaire de l'ordre juridique canadien et celle des Premières Nations. La professeure Boissel complète actuellement son doctorat en droit à l'Université de Victoria. Sa thèse doctorale porte sur le constitutionnalisme Stallow ou les et les traditions juridiques des peuples Salish, originaires du sud de la Colombie-Britannique. Elle est boursière de la Fondation Trudeau et du Conseil de recherche en sciences humaines du Canada. La professeure Boissel est titulaire d'un baccalauréat en droit civil et en common law de l'Université McGill et d'une maîtrise en droit de notre faculté. Son mémoire de maîtrise, qui portait sur la consultation des peuples autochtones, s'est mérité le prix de l'Association des professeurs de droit du Québec en 2008. Avant d'entreprendre ses études supérieures, André Boissel a pratiqué le litige civil et commercial dans les bureaux montréalais d'un cabinet d'avocats national et a fait du travail sur une, base, sur une base contractuelle à la Cour suprême du Canada. Le titre de la conférence de cet après-midi est « Indigenous Legal Systems and Governance, Eliminating Pre- and Post-Contact Distinctions in Canadian Constitutional Law ». C'est donc avec un très grand plaisir que j'invite le professeur John Burroughs à venir prendre la parole. D'abord, dans un deuxième temps, la professeure Boissel interviendra immédiatement après et nous avons réservé une période à la fin pour des questions et interventions euh, de votre part. Donc, sans plus tarder, je cède la parole au professeur Paul. Bonjour, nous sommes les gens qui sont 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 Giganos, Nijnakas, Neashi, Nigaming and Donjaba, Niging and Dodem. Nuitash and Don Chenak and Gawen Nungo. I'm grateful for the opportunity that I've been given to be able to come and speak with you here. I'm thankful to be amongst friends. I'm very grateful for Jean Leclerc and that wonderful introduction. It was so fantastic to be able to have him in our community for four days over this past week, to be able to be on the land, on the water, in the forests, and uh, associating in that space. I mentioned at that time that he feels like uh, he's a, a brother, a kindred spirit, and it's unusual sometimes in the world to be able to encounter that from afar. And uh, I found that in his writing, and as I've gotten to know him, I've also found that just in the way we're able to relate with one another. And I'm also grateful for Andre in being here today and for the contribution that she will make. She's long been, uh, a uh, teacher of mine, as she's gone through her graduate work and into law school, I find as I look at the world through the ways that she introduces to me, I understand things in a different light. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to uh, be able to be around people who are th so thoughtful and are so kind in the way that those thoughts can be expressed. I'm also grateful that you're here and to be able to participate in a little bit of a conversation at the end of this session together. I'd like to acknowledge the uh, host of this uh, um, lecture series and whose name this is uh, initiated, and I'm grateful for that. I also like to acknowledge the territory that we're on, uh, 
Haudenosaunee and their relationship with this place for thousands of years, as well as the Algonquian people and their relationship uh, with this place. Today, as was mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about the way Canadian law deals with Indigenous peoples. I spend much of my time speaking about these things and then also speaking on the other side of the equation, trying to understand Indigenous peoples' own legal perspectives on these issues. Um, and so I will talk about the Canadian side of this, but I hope as Andre offers his rem her remarks and then we go into the discussion afterwards that we we'll may, may be able to talk more about Indigenous legal traditions and their role in this uh, issue. As uh, many of you may know, Indigenous peoples were the first governments in North America, and the Supreme Court of Canada itself has recognized this point. In the Calder case in 1973, it made the following observation. It said, the fact is that when settlers came, the Indians were there, organized in societies, occupying the land as their forefathers had done for centuries. Canada has used the term nation in describing indigenous peoples and their pre-existing forms of political organization. Indigenous nationhood is a collective right derived from, in our Canadian context, the common law's recognition of indigenous people's prior social organization before Europeans came to this shore. And contemporary indigenous nationhood has a continuity with those pre-existing laws, practices, and customs. And this continuity of social organization animates our world. In this respect, indigenous people's laws should be a vital part of Canada's legal framework. Unfortunately, the expansive character of these laws has not been given sufficient weight in Canada's jurisprudence. Indigenous nationhood, I believe, remains hidden in plain sight, despite its influence on Canada's constitutional order. Now, these laws that Indigenous peoples carry, which we, I taught at the University of Toronto, having the students come into my community for four days two weeks ago, the Osgood students came last week, these legal orders are unwritten by and large in terms of uh, English or French or Anishinaabemowin, but they are written on the earth. And people, through illiteracy that has a discipline attached to it, can learn how to read those laws from the earth and find analogies which can be brought into contemporary practice. But the unwritten nature of these uh, traditions should not dissuade us from finding their recognition and growth. As we know, Canada by and large has an unwritten constitution. The fact that uh, constitution does not mention democracy, for instance, the rule of law or judicial independence in its written text is not fatal to its operation. Unwritten customs are a part of our tradition for at least three reasons. First of all, Canada has a living tree as a metaphor for the way we describe our constitutionalism, which means that textualism does not exhaust the field of constitutional possibility. Secondly, Canada's constitution is similar in principle to that of Great Britain, which makes parts of it non-textual, as the preamble to the Constitution makes clear. And then thirdly, Canada is built in relation to Indigenous peoples in both positive and negative ways. They are simultaneously, as Indigenous peoples, partners in confederation and also colonized subordinates whose dispossession underwrote and continues to underwrite this country's development. We need to find ways to take account of that in 
our constitutionalism and hopefully change those negative components of that relationship. As the court, though, has developed its doctrines in thinking about Aboriginal people's laws and rights and government in Canada, we have fallen victim to history as a way of understanding Aboriginal rights in patterns which continue to marginalize Aboriginal peoples. While we must recognize that Indigenous governments' practices pre-exist the Canadian state, we must not presume that those practices remain static or unaffected by the passages of time or the ravages of colonialism. Nations change, wither, reemerge, grow, and transform, just like we saw when we were on the land these past couple of weeks. Indigenous peoples take patterns from that circle of life, and they create law in the present day. Indigenous law is integral to Indigenous governance because it is the means by which decision-making remains relevant in the present day. Times change, and Indigenous peoples must adapt. In fact, the Supreme Court, in one passage, recognizes this point in their leading case dealing with the proof of Aboriginal rights. In the Vanderpeet case, coming from the Supreme Court in 1996, Chief Justice Lemaire wrote, quote, Aboriginal people's occupation and use of North America was not static. As a general principle, should, as, nor as a general principle should be the Aboriginal rights flowing from it. Natives migrated in response to events such as war, epidemic, famine, dwindling game reserves, etc. Aboriginal practice and customs and traditions um, also changed and evolved, including the utilization of the land, the methods of hunting and fishing, trade between tribes, and so on. This is an important recognition in a leading case of the flexibility, the fluidity, of indigenous laws, customs, and traditions. Um, recognition of this fact, again, is vital to Canada's unwritten constitution. Uh, for these reasons, constitutional practitioners must not treat indigenous law as history solely in understanding the country's constitution. Treating indigenous law as history erases the flu fluidity, mobility, and contingencies of Indigenous peoples' conflicting, contradictory, and cross-cutting accounts of themselves through time. That is, originalist views of Indigenous nationhood and governance must be rigorously resisted. Originalism is not congruent with Canadian constitutional law. History should not be at the center of constitutional interpretation, though it is an important aid. While history can be an important aid, we must remember that law and history have different disciplinary touchstones. Historians search for evidence of past events relatively uncontaminated by interpretations which flow through the passage of time. While law seeks to explicitly interpret the past in a better light, in light of the present. Um, F.W. Maitland observed, quote, what a lawyer wants is authority, and the newer the better. What the historian wants is evidence, and the older the better. Law often uses history in opportunistic, selective, and decontextualized ways. This can be a good thing, if courts are transparent and explicit in using history in this way as a legal resource rather than an objective truth about what took place in the past. The separation of history from law when dealing with indigenous governance and nationhood can help us 
deal with this issue in a contemporary setting. Um, that is, to exercise governance today, courts should not demand proof of Aboriginal governance and other practices prior to the arrival of Europeans, as the current test requires. That is, in order for Aboriginal peoples to claim rights, title, today, the thing that they claim must have been integral to their distinctive culture prior to the arrival of Europeans. We must not engage in that equivalency. Instead, we must assume that Indigenous peoples practiced law and exercised government in expansive and varying ways which continue to change through time. Practicing constitutional law in this way frees us from at least two problems. First, it disposes of the colonial premise of the moment of European contact or the assertion of sovereignty as being the definitive all or nothing moment for establishing an Aboriginal right. Like this approach, finding that something must be integral to distinctive culture prior to the arrival of Europeans, this approach inappropriately freezes Aboriginal rights by reference to colonial events. It privileges non-Aboriginal legal and political development and subordinates indigenous forms of social organization. Second, recognizing that history does not have to simultaneously function as laws frees indigenous peoples from the fiction that their histories must show equivalence with their laws to receive protection, recognition, and affirmation under Section 35. That is, to exercise governance in the present day, indigenous people should not feel compelled or incentivized to prove that their current governance and legal practices stem from pre-contact customs. Not everything that occurred in the past is relevant to contemporary indigenous governance. Furthermore, forcing Indigenous peoples to demonstrate an historic practice to prove a contemporary right can lead to troubling fictions. It fosters problematic posturing around Indigenous authenticity. Right? What was authentic prior to the arrival of Europeans to receive protection then becomes the thing that's lifted as authentic in the present day. This can promote troubling stereotypes. It can promote questionable positions about the timeless nature of Indigenous legal principles, processes, and practices. The court's own test can fo foment fundamentalist, essentialized, and universalized views about pre-contact Indigenous life. The so-called continuity of these historical fictions can be unworkable in the present because such practices do not have tangible living connections to either historic or contemporary realities. So our constitution as a legal framework must be more transparent and interrogate these connections between history and law when we're dealing with indigenous peoples. That is, and this is going to be blasphemy to historians, law must continue to regard the past as a grab bag of possibilities for present reasoning rather than a constraint on present developments because they do not have analogies to bygone errors. Now, there are four ways that I think Canada can start to move towards the rejection of these distinctions, um, um, or these analogies, I, I say, that are drawn between law and history. First of all, I believe it's important that we nuance firstness. I'm going to explain what I mean here. As a constitutional matter, the legal significance of Indigenous people's temporal priority should be nuanced. It is the fact that groups were organized in an area prior to other groups coming into this area, but it shouldn't control 
the entire relationships between the parties. Temporal firstness can be dominant, but not determinative in our legal system. Um, that is, I'm arguing here for the re rejection of absolutist positions on the grounds of firstness. There's a couple of reasons for this. One, this could prevent a, an idea of absolute firstness, could prevent indigenous peoples themselves from securing protections for their land use and governance, since many indigenous peoples believe they were not here first in their constitutional systems. I'll explain that in a moment. But categorical firstness could displace indigenous normative orders. Firstness is also problematic because it can prevent non-indigenous peoples from enjoying legitimate claims to governance and land use in North America. So first of all, why might firstness be a problem for indigenous peoples? Well, indigenous peoples, legal traditions, often recognize the moral force and agency of the natural world. And in Anishinaabemowin, the Algonquian language that I speak, the world is divided between animate and less animate, or animate and inanimate. Things that are living or less living, living or not living. Some of these things that are living in Anishinaabemowin, not just philosophically, but hardwired into systems of thinking, are things like rocks. Rocks have a moral agency. Rocks have a life force that has to be involved in legal reasoning in an Anishinaabe system. This is why claims to absolute rights based on temporal priority could undermine indigenous people's own laws. Because of the animacy of these beings, rivers and mountains and rocks can have their own legal personalities, plants, insects and birds and animals, can be regarded as having a social organization in areas which pre-existed indigenous people's arri arrival. As such, humans would not be able to do anything in relationship to these pre-existing orders if we took absolute positions. So what happens is indigenous people's laws find place and ways to be able to interact with and sometimes disturb that temporal priority that rocks, plants, and animals have with indigenous uh, uh, peoples. Um, we can move in the world. We can organize ourselves politically and socially, even though we are the last on the scene as human beings. We have in our law practices of consultation, accommodation, free and prior and informed consent towards the environment, towards nature, which are a part of our own constitutional systems. And while these things can be subject to crass stereotypes if looked at from outside of the system, speaking and listening to the water, the birds, the insects, the plants, and the animals before infringement of their life forces occurs is a significant legal obligation within many indigenous legal systems. It is found in many water laws, fasting protocols, uh, pipe ceremonies, uh, first, uh, first of the season killing ceremonies, etc. That is a categorical deference to non-human temporal priority in Canadian constitutional law can be dealt with by looking at um, and overcoming that by looking to indigenous systems of law. The nuances here um, are, are potentially significant. Um, that is, when non-indigenous peoples came to North America, they often entered into treaty with indigenous peoples. Now, some might regard that treaty process as just a simple real estate transaction that turned land from one group of people to another group of people and ceded and surrendered any future relationship that indigenous peoples might have with that land. That's one view. It's an impoverished view. It's not a view that would accord with most indigenous legal orders. What occurred 
from many of these indigenous legal perspectives is that the people that were coming to this place were invited into the indigenous legal order to be able to find ways as others were coming to further displace some of those life forces that are on the land as people would take up um, places for settlement or for trade or for creating all sorts of other transactions that would come from European influence. The notion here is that when historic treaties were endorsed, indigenous peoples invited the crown to live in accordance with indigenous legal orders. In this setting, indigenous law can constitutionally empower non-indigenous peoples to recognize and affirm indigenous law as a part of broader Canadian law and then it also empowers non-Indigenous peoples to be able to interact with the world and find a legitimate place in this order that um, participates in the nuancing of firstness. You don't have to be here first in order to pursue governance, but it does require a relationality with the peoples that were here before and also a relationality with the life forces that surround the territories that uh, people came to. This can provide pathways for uh, a, a deeper, I think, engagement with our place in this country under this unwritten constitutional order. Um, we had a pipe ceremony down on the lawn of uh, McGill Law School this morning, uh, where for an hour and a half an elder led us in an invocation of our responsibilities to treat that land in that place with respect, referring to the four different directions, referring to the plants and the winds and the animals and the rocks in that pipe ceremony, which often preceded the treaties, is the, um, the writing, is the, is the memorial, is the seal of the agreement that was reenacted in that space that has us pay attention to this nuancing of humans basically being pitiful or, or needing the support of the earth around them in order to make our way in this land together. So that's one way that we could maybe break out law and history as always being analogous uh, to one another. Even though we're drawing on history, we're not finding it determinative. The second issue that I want to discuss is overruling the court's position in the 1996 decisions in the Supreme Court of Canada, Vander Peet, which I've already referred to, and the Pomaduan case. As you remember, these cases require that practices, customs, and traditions be rooted in pre-contact societies of the Aboriginal community in order to constitute Aboriginal rights. This means that unless a post-contact practice, customer tradition can be shown to have continuity with the pre-contact practice, custom, or tradition, it will not be held to be an Aboriginal right. Justice Ledoux de Bay perceptively wrote that such an approach as adopted by the majority is too categorical. I believe this is a wise insight. Reference to pre- and post-contact divisions for proving Aboriginal rights does not encourage appropriate nuance and protection in relationship to contemporary governance issues. Um, she wrote, whether something is integral or not is an all or nothing test. All or nothing tests, particularly when centered around issues of temporal priority, right, did you do it before contact or not? Right, all or nothing tests do not allow for flexibility and fluidity in reconciling constitutional relationships. Categorical all-or-nothing tests or approaches to Aboriginal rights have frequently resulted in Aboriginal peoples receiving nothing 
Two decades of jurisprudence related to Vanderpeet demonstrates this fact. In the Pomaduin case, we have an outline of the narrowness of this approach. This is a case that dealt with the right to self-government. The court found that broad powers of governance could not be assumed. The Chief Justice wrote, Aboriginal rights, including those asserted to self-government, must be looked at in light of the specific circumstances of each case, and in particular, in light of the specific history and culture of the Aboriginal group claiming the right. Now, in that case, Aboriginal peoples were claiming the right to engage in high-stakes gaming uh, in order to create economic opportunities in their community. They were really claiming the right to create an economic development regime in accordance with their contemporary aspirations. And in order to do that, you need to have law-making power to regulate these businesses that would be established in their midst. What the court did instead is it asked whether or not Ojibwe people gambled prior to the arrival of Europeans. And they found that they did. They did gamble prior to the arrival of Europeans. In fact, it was really important to the culture. But high stakes gambling <laughs> wasn't something that was taking place in 1600. And since high stakes gambling didn't take place in 1600, that's not something that could be claimed in the present day. So this test, integral to a distinctive culture, uh, prevents Aboriginal peoples from characterizing their claim as a broad right to use and manage their land for a wide variety of purposes. Um, when Indigenous peoples cannot make their law-making power generalized, then indigenous peoples are cut off from the normative wisdom which flows from their worldviews, their legal approaches. But Canadians are also cut off from the wisdom of this normative approach, which is not perfect at all, as Jean mentioned. There are as many flaws in indigenous legal systems as you'll find in the common law, civil law, and other legal systems. Despite those flaws, there is wisdom there. And in the comparison and in the contrast of these different positions, we might sometimes find new insight. We lose the benefit of that insight because we don't see ourselves as clearly as we might, because we don't see the contrast that might lie on the other side of our choices when we see the distinctions and the differences that can flow in indigenous communities. So our unwritten constitution is diminished and colonialism is empowered as an insatiable force in this country as we take this path that's set out in the Vanderpeet and in the Pomaduan decisions. This must be overturned. Not only does it draw on stereotypes dealing with indigenous peoples, those stereotypes draw on troubling racialized notions about essentialized views of indigeneity. This is also just contrary to good governance, to freeze uh, these artificial constructs. So we can nuance firstness and bring indigenous legal orders more fully into light. We could also overrule the Vanderpeet Pomaduan distinction between pre and post contact. There's also something else, a third point, that could be taken up to challenge uh, um, this distinction between um, uh, law and history, or to have us work more, more forcefully on it, um, which is to adopt something known as the reserved rights doctrine. 
Uh, I've taught in the United States, as was mentioned, and I taught US constitutional law, uh, but I also taught what's called federal Indian law, which is the law of the United States dealing with Indians. I also taught a course in tribal courts and had a 1,300-page casebook as tribal nations across that country have constitutions, legislation, regulation, and then the common law of their own story and language to fill in the blanks and to give meaning to those kinds of provisions. One of the central pillars of federal Indian law in the United States is what is known as the reserved rights doctrine. This means that indigenous peoples have everything that you would presume a nation would have until such time as they explicitly give it over to another. Um, that is, indigenous peoples, if they do not give those rights to governance, governments, remain vested with those rights. Um, the, the leading case dealing with this doctrine is called Wynans. It comes out of the Supreme Court of the United States in the 1890s, which says treaties are grant of rights from the Indians, not to the Indians. So in other words, the assumption is that the, the government has nothing until such time as Indians give them something, and the only thing that the government gets is what is given, and if it's not given, it remains vested, it remains reserved to the Aboriginal group. If you look across this country, it would be hard to find a treaty where an indigenous group would say, we give you the crown, the right to take over our governments, our laws, our authorities. Um, those just weren't explicitly a part of what people were talking about in those arrangements. And it would be easy to find that whatever is not granted remains. And governance is one of those things that wasn't granted, therefore it remains. This happens to accord with a strand of Supreme Court jurisprudence which has recognized indigenous peoples as nations. In a case in 1990 uh, called Siwi, the court wrote the following. The Indian nations were regarded in their relations with the European nations which occupied North America they were regarded as independent nations. As the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court said in 1832 in a case called Worcester versus the State of Georgia about British policy towards the end, or sorry, the mid 18th century, quote, such was the policy of Great Britain toward Indian nations inhabiting the territory from which she excluded all other Europeans. Such her claims, such her practical exposition of the charter she had granted. And then here's the important part. This is an expression of British policy. She considered them as nations capable of maintaining the relations of peace and war, of governing themselves under her protection, and she made treaties with them, the obligation which she acknowledged. That is... Canada's Constitution did not create indigenous governance. It merely recognizes and sustains or reserves to the Indians its ongoing force. Contact and the assertion of crown sovereignty recede, in this view, as touchstones for indigenous governance. This point was made clearly in the early case of Connolly and Woolrich which uh, centered around the issue of whether the common law could recognize Cree law and affirm obligations made under an indigenous nation's law. The Quebec courts in 1867 found this as possible, and it held that indigenous political organization was not abolished by crown contact or assertions of sovereignty. In making this point, the court noted, and I quote, they ask a rhetorical question first, and then they answer it, so I'm quoting. Will it be contended that the territorial rights political organization, such as it was, 
or the laws and usages of Indian tribes are abrogated, that they cease to exist when two European nations began to trade with the Aboriginal occupants? In my opinion, the court says, it is beyond controversy that they did not cease to exist. Uh, now I'm adding my own commentary. They did not cease to exist as, no, as Europeans started to trade with indigenous peoples. The court, then I go on now, that so far from being abolished, they were left in full force and were not even modified to the slightest degree. This Conley case affirms this reserved rights doctrine that, is, that survives the assertion of crown sovereignty. The value of this approach is that it challenges the positions put forward in the Vanderpeet and the Famajuan case. It does not require proof of precise practices prior to the arrival of Europeans to gain protection in a contemporary context. This line of reason has been sustained in other cases. The Mitchell case, uh, again coming out of Quebec here in 2001, said European settlement did not terminate the interests of Aboriginal peoples arising from the historic occupation and use of land. To the contrary, Aboriginal interests and customary laws were presumed to survive the assertion of sovereignty and, regard, re, and were absorbed into the common law as rights. If we used reconciliation, which is the constitutional lens that the court says we should be looking at these issues through, if we use reconciliation as the lens from looking at governance, we would find that these laws can coexist. And now there's a whole lot of mechanisms between the civil law and the common law to work out that coexistence, right? Uh, there's harmonization uh, legislation. There's bureaucracies that are set to that task in Ottawa. You have section 92 of the constitution that protects property and civil rights in the province. There is three members of the Supreme Court of Canada that have knowledge in the civil law system when we're working to figure out how these legal systems can coexist. And we have that opportunity to enrich, yes, complicate, but enrich our experiences in this country by pulling upon reconciliation as indigenous reserved laws become part of an anti-colonial vision of our constitution that doesn't subordinate Aboriginal peoples in questionable, stereotypical ways. The final point I want to put forward in advancing this idea, which is to turn to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This declaration does not require proof of pre- or post-contact um, sovereign assertions. Rights are vested in peoples. Indigenous peoples are peoples. Their exercise is not contingent on a non-Indigenous event in this declaration. Article 1 says, Indigenous peoples have the right to the full enjoyment as a collective or as individuals of all human rights and fundamental freedoms as recognized in the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and an international human rights law." End quote. The incorporation of universal, although I'm going to question universal in other settings, but the incorporation of these human rights standards is an important step in undercutting Pomodouin and Vanderpeet. Um, Articles 4 and 5 of the United Nations Declaration say, Indigenous peoples and exercising their right to self-determination, have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters related to their internal or local affairs, as well as ways and means for financing their autonomous functions. Read autonomous nuanced there. Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political, legal, economic, social, and cultural institutions while retaining their right to fully participate, if they so choose, in the political, economic, social, and cultural life of the state. 
We should be able to be citizens of Canada and our provinces and also citizens of our nation under this UNDRIP framework. Article 27 says that Indigenous law should be a part of nation states' constitutions. Quote, states shall establish and implement in conjunction with Indigenous peoples a fair, independent, impartial, open, and transparent process giving due regard to Indigenous peoples' laws, traditions, customs, and land tenure systems to recognize and adjudicate the rights of Indigenous peoples pertaining to their lands, territories, and resources. This standard has already been pulled upon in Canadian law, although by way of implication. The Chilcotin case, which proved Aboriginal title in British Columbia rested on the bedrock of years and years and years of Aboriginal peoples pleading their law to show how they had a relationship to their territory, they governed their territory through their law. This Article 27, which says you should refer to Indigenous peoples' laws in adjudicating Indigenous claims, now be needs to become more explicit, and it needs to occur also, as the article says, I mean, conjunction with Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples also have many other rights in this declaration that don't require showing that it was integral to our distinctive culture prior to others arriving here. Now here's a bit of an innovation. I also think that Indigenous peoples themselves could implement this declaration within their own nations to ensure that their own people are both empowered by and protected from their own governments. In this respect, this declaration would be further entrenched as a part of Canada's constitution as we regard this being within section 35 as well. That is, UNDRIP, as the acronym is, is an indigenous instrument. It was broadly created by indigenous peoples when it was negotiated at the United Nations for over 30 years. Internal adoption within Indigenous communities of these principles would radically challenge Indigenous governments, but would also radically challenge Canada as Indigenous peoples took up these provisions and perhaps modeled some of these provisions, how they would be interpreted in Indigenous legal contexts. So, Rights identified in these declarations should be available within self-governing Indigenous nations across Canada. Article 1 of the declaration indicates that Indigenous individuals possess human rights. Quote, Indigenous peoples have the right to the full enjoyment as a collective or as individuals of all human rights and fundamental freedoms recognized in the Charter of the United Nations, the UNDRIP and international human rights law. In this view, it would not be contrary to the spirit of the declaration that Indigenous governments have obligations in relationships to individuals who fall within their jurisdiction. The Declaration relates these following rights and freedoms. Religion, spiritual beliefs and practices, speech and expression, association. Right, All of these things, as we're currently thinking about them, are Indigenous peoples making claims against the United States to respect our rights to religion, spirituality, speech, expression, association. But imagine if those also had internal dimensions. Life, liberty, security, property, family togetherness, a right not to be discriminated against by their governments, the privileges and immunities of citizenship, language, education, labor fairness, administrative law provisions of notice, fairness, and hearing, health care, gender equality, in accordance with the limitations imposed by law, in accordance with international law. Now, these things, as taken into Indigenous legal communities, will have different flavors to them. The law of equality might have another story attached to it. If it is adjudicated in a circle or a feast or <coughs> other kind of Indigenous form, but there would still be the attempt within that form to address what their laws require that are in accordance with 
the spirit of what uh, that declaration puts forward. This notion of self-determination really does take us beyond history. It's a notion that's going to be challenging to many indigenous governments, but I think walk the talk. If you're gonna ask the Canadian government to do this thing, then be prepared in your own way to also do this thing. Not by cutting and pasting what Canada does and having that Trojan horse of Western law jump into the community and sort of jump out and just take over the legal system in another way, but by fully engaging with the vibrant legal world around us. Indigenous laws are that vibrant. They can be nuanced and they it doesn't have to be, although it could be, it doesn't have to be assimilation to take those provisions on if they're done in ways that recognize, affirm, and give respect to the normative orders of Anishinaabe, Salish, Shwetnik, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, Inuit, Métis, Gitsan, Wet'suwet'en, Haida, all of these nations have ways that can take these things in contemporary settings and get rid of those stereotypes. Miigwech bizinwek, miyu, ahau. Thank you for listening. C'est un très grand plaisir et un honneur d'être ici aujourd'hui, de retour dans une de mes Allemands mater. Euh, ça me fait très, très grand plaisir. Merci aux organisateurs de l'invitation. Euh, je vais vous parler en anglais aujourd'hui, moi aussi. Euh, je n'avais pas prévu faire ça, mais c'est comme ça que ça s'est produit. Pour moi, c'est sorti en anglais, euh, mais je promets de mettre euh, les notes sous forme euh, euh, en, en forme euh, française pour la publication. Um, so, um, the approach I'm going to take uh, today to pull on <clears throat> one of the threads of the vision that John presented to us uh, today is informed through and through by uh, the work I've been doing for almost a decade now with um, to learn Indigenous law with one society and uh, within one Indigenous legal tradition, uh, that of the Coast Salish in uh, southwestern BC. I will not draw specifically on it, but I just need to say that, that it's, the, it's really the place I come from now alongside a, a prior training in uh, civil and common law. Um, I'm just going to start by recapping briefly uh, the message and the vision that I heard in uh, John's talk and paper, and then I will um, just highlight one thread that is, as he also uh, said at the beginning, is the one he uh, is, is, about, is, is not really able to talk about as much as he uh, wanted to for the purposes of this lecture, but it's the, the one thread about How do we engage indigenous legal traditions um, and take up this enormous challenge that uh, he hints at throughout in his lecture uh, is the task ahead for us in Canada. So about this quick recap, the, as I hear John and as I'm sure you've heard him uh, loud and clear as well, the path that he illuminated today is uh, basically toward uh, the decolonization of Canadian law. He invites us to basically abandon the colonial doctrinal premises that shape our law and our constitutional arrangements and to finally really do uh, more than uh, um, pay lip service Uh, and really acknowledge that indigenous society in societies in this country have always been and continue to be simply fully fledged equal societies on par with the other societies that uh, whose laws and institutions have given shape to Canada as we currently know it relating respectfully 
uh, to them as such, fully-fledged equal societies implies adopting as a premise that they have always had and continue to exercise jurisdiction over themselves and their respective territories according to their own intellectual, physical, spiritual resources, which include their distinctive legal traditions. John zeroed in, I think, really um, adequately, uh, to say the least, on um, the deep shift in Canadian jurisprudence that needs to happen um, in the way that it imposes or uh, warps the uh, relationship that Indigenous societies have to time and the way we from outside of them think about their relationship to time and impose um, a particular relationship to time on them, which is something that um, deprives them or uh, prevents them or at, at the very least uh, hinders them, is a hindrance on their uh, path of just like any other, uh, any other society and um, just going through that very complex alchemy of continuity and change through which any society draws on its own heritage and inheritance to remain itself even as it transform itself in a continuous way using its own culturally rooted mechanisms of adaptation um, to new experiences, new influences, uh, new problems, a process that I think of as the very essence of freedom. I hear John's call um, in the doctrinal piece that he uh, delivered today as having a particularly strong resonance uh, for the judiciary since the particular colonial premise that he highlights that is uh, making the hallmark of indigenous identity and of the rights flowing from it, the particular set of customs and practices that are traceable through to pre-European time, um, such premises were fashioned in the course of judicial interpretation. And so it's incumbent and available to uh, the judiciary to, um, to act um, to, um, uh, to reverse uh, those interpretations. John also shows uh, with uh, other parts of his talk that the tools we need to dismantle really this cornerstone of the colonial house are at hand part of our constitutional structure, not needing constitutional am amendments, um, and parts of the constitutional conventions and, and other just tr tradition-based conventions uh, that surround uh, the changing of, of a course, charting a new course uh, in the law now also augmented, as he uh, pointed out as well, by the adoption by Canada of, the, of UNDRIP. Um, what I want to focus on today is, is really the way in which um, not only the judiciary, but uh, really I'm quite certain everyone in this room beyond members of uh, the bench um, have also um, a role to play and can get engaged as full participants in um, the other task that is written through his uh, lecture, which is beyond the, decolon the basic decolonization of legal mechanisms in Canadian law, also the actual positive engagement and learning of the multiple indigenous legal traditions that are uh, comprised within the land we call Canada. Uh, so that's uh, what I want to address in the remainder of, of my time. Le living together in, a, in what would then be a decolonized legal space means engaging much more seriously with concretizing intersocietal law across indigenous and non-indigenous normative uh, traditions. This notion of intersocietal law, which to this day really remains, as uh, John also noted, mainly just an aspiration, even if the Supreme Court reiterates it as a guiding principle 
throughout its Aboriginal law jurisprudence and has been for uh, two decades now, it just remains an aspiration. The court does not actually engage in this process of taking really seriously, uh, with the exception, I would agree, of Judge uh, Vickers, not uh, the, the Supreme Court Justice, the trial judge in the Tsilkotin case, um, and the, the Connolly and Woolrich case, there's really not a lot of other examples that we have uh, of seeing uh, the court actually grapple with the work of uh, learning. It's a daunting task for sure when you are on the bench and that's why it needs to start way before and it's a task that we, we need to engage in as um, faculty members, as students uh, of the law, um, and, and so here are a few thoughts uh, on this. To me, this is the real, uh, not to say that uh, it's not a creative and transformative challenge uh, for Canadian, Canadian law to abandon the colonial premises that John has talked about, but what's the real exciting um, uh, creative and transformative uh, challenge for Canadian law over the next two decades because I'm, I'm kind of hoping we can deal with everything we've talked about, you know, in the next year or two, um, <laughs> is, uh, is the, the challenge of creating a widespread engagement with Indigenous legal traditions across the Canadian legal system uh, in a way that respects, on the one hand, the distinctiveness and integrity of each of those very different legal traditions, at the very least as I see them, and as I said at the outset, I am just starting after a decade to find my footing in one of them, and so I, I won't speak, I will make a couple of generalizations, but flag them as such. At the very least, they're as different between themselves as are definitely the civil and the common law worlds. Um, in some cases, actually much more. They've had uh, less contact among themselves in, in some cases, and in other cases, they've had a lot, like the French and the English on, uh, in, the, um, in the European context, and definitely much more uh, within the context of Canadian history. So creating this widespread engagement with Indigenous legal traditions needs to respect this huge diversity um, but it also has to be done in a way that's capable of eventually, at least, bridging the real gap between uh, the kind of subjectivity that is fostered by Canadian law and, um, in general, I would say, Western ways, um, the modes of engagement of those Euro, um, Anglo, American, uh, traditions, the types of relationships that they encode, and the kinds of uh, institutions that have emerged, bridging the gap between those in the context of the state and how they manifest coming out of um, indigenous um, societies. So this, this challenge involves creating in a really, again, broad and widespread manner and in high numbers to really change in um, you know, the mid or long term, the Canadian legal system as a whole, real, creating real interlocutors for each of those traditions. Legal thinkers and practitioners familiar and at ease, if not completely fluent, in specific indigenous legal universes. In a word, I think law school, as I said, really have a huge role to play in this. And to talk about what this role entails and point as concretely as I can to how it might develop in the future and the vision of Canada that might emerge out of this, I want to also chime in and tell you a little bit uh, more about the Anishinaabe law camp that you've heard already a little bit about. To me, the, the camp is just one example, but I think a really excellent one, of a starting point in facing up to this enormous task. Uh, 
of reshaping Canadian law by educating its practitioners, its upcoming, uh, the new generations coming out of law schools, uh, educating them in Indigenous legal traditions. I'll show you a couple of pictures because now I'm the third person to talk about this and I thought you might want to actually have a couple of shots of what it looks like. But I'm not sure I know yeah, how I think it's working. You just, uh, I think now it is. So the two buttons on the right and the left. Um, the Anishinaabe Law Camp is in its third year. So the third camp was actually just held, as you heard this past weekend, in the Yashi Nigaming, also known as Cape Croker on Georgian Bay. This is the home territory, as you've also already heard, of the Chippewas of Newash, which is the, commun the community that the Boros family belongs to. And the camp started three years ago and keeps going, thanks um, completely to John and his family. Uh, and communities, very extraordinarily, <laughs> extraordinarily generous welcome, uh, and their willingness to host, uh, in the case of, um, of Osgood, and teach over four days, so a long weekend uh, in September, a group of about 40 of us, uh, mostly JD students, but also uh, consistently um, for the past uh, three years, something like six or seven faculty members. Um, you've heard about a few special guests, uh, such as law professors from other schools, but also um, I believe we've had a governing uh, member from the Law Society, so the Barreau du Québec would be the equivalent, judges from the Superior Court of Ontario uh, as well, um, and lawyers. So our teachers during um, during this um, the, the this weekend are thinkers, knowledge holders, legal practitioners in the community, elders, uh, people involved in the continuous knitting of the order of their of their own community based on the way they've been taught uh, to care for themselves, for each other, and for their land. Uh, John himself. Uh, as you now know, and his daughter, Lindsay, who will see speak uh, here, uh, are at the very heart of that group. Um, and a number of people uh, from their community join them um, every year. So what do we do during camp? You're seeing us uh, sit around or stand and, and listen. Um, through a number of different activities, we're taught about relationships the interdependency among uh, and between humans and non-humans, the ways in which uh, principles uh, about how to behave responsibly are inscribed in the land itself or are encoded in stories and their characters' interactions. We learn about some of the specific traits of the land we're on in this vast Anishinaabe world we're in kind of in the, in the heart of it. And uh, we um, learn about historic treaties, I believe. Um, I have a picture of John as well with a, um, a wampum. Um, so um, the historic treaties, but also more recent interactions uh, of the Chippewas on the Saugeen uh, Peninsula with Canadian law in and out uh, of the courts through the perspective of other guests as well who uh, are directly involved uh, in negotiating um, or in just uh, being subjected to some of the interventions and consequences of Canadian law in their lives. And what we do there is just start, as I, I say, this is just a start, obviously it's just four days, but we start thinking about how applying some of those Anishinaabe principles we learn about might yield different outcomes in the context of those interactions. In a more amorphous way, I would also say that we learn um, Anishinaabe law from witnessing how community members relate to each other, how they address each other, and how they speak and act in relation to us uh, who are their guests on their territory. 
as I mentioned, this is only four days, um, and only then the most cursory introduction to a rich and complex tradition that, as I said, spans a, a vast territory. So it's just a seed, and much more work uh, needs to flow from it to deepen the engagement, create longer stays and learning projects for uh, law students in relation um, and connection to the community's own capacity uh, and needs as well. Uh, forming a fuller picture of the body of stories uh, that the few we raise and discuss uh, during camp consist in, um, and how those stories hang together, how they inform more daily or uh, mundane interactions within Chippewa society today. Much more curriculum needs to be developed uh, to go through those questions and a lot of others with uh, personal relationships with the community and direct experience on the land remaining at the heart uh, of such developments. Um, I, yes, so engaging with the stories, that's one of the activities that I had in mind. Um, to show you. Um, becoming conversant in an indigenous legal universe uh, cannot, uh, I think, obviously separate the intellectual tools and uh, the conceptual vocabulary fleshing out relationships, principles, and mechanisms of decision making and of holding people to account from legal pedagogy. Pedagogy is an integral part of, a, of any given normative universe. So this is to say that what is presented to us is also a major challenge for our law schools, establishing and deepening their community connections and figuring out how to build programs in a real collaboration with communities willing to host and to guide such learning. Um, and also figuring out what can be taught uh, properly, adequately, um, appropriately within the walls of a school, um, of the school itself, and what can only be taught uh, through uh, direct experience and the facilitation of direct relationships uh, between the students, um, the faculty, and the community, and the teachers within the community. Um, so I think um, just zeroing in or, or honing on the, um, one of the most powerful outcomes of those barely four days of camp uh, yearly. And you know, with 40 people, that's already a, a very big group. Uh, but it's you know, to situate within the context of a school like this one uh, or of a school like Osgood, it's you know, again, a speck in like a huge crowd. There's 800 JD students at Osgood uh, in, in all the years combined. So the 40 who go are like this nugget of really committed, interested people who are going to, to uh, carry teachings back with them, but in, a, in, a, in this big group um, that is back at, um, at the, within the walls of the institution. Um, I think one of the most powerful things uh, that come out of this experience is that the students, the students really connect with the teachers they meet in the community. And so um, we're able to see already, and that was true the first year as well, but this year it's like within days of camp happening we see this, is that they're organizing to go back informally on their own time because they're invited personally through those personal connections that they've made. And so they will just organize in small groups and clusters and go back and hear uh, Tony talk um, about uh, make it, do an owl walk, or they will be able to sit more with some of the elders that they connected with. Um, another really powerful outcome, I was uh, dwelling a little bit on uh, the picture of uh, some of our faculty members who were there a couple of years ago. Uh, this is some of them. Um, for faculty members too, this triggers their own imagination. 
uh, for how to engage students with Anishinaabe law in their own courses for people who don't teach Aboriginal law and who are not taking on this uh, task or the, don't have it as part of their background to create those field courses or those longer stays with community. All other faculty members, some of whom you see here, um, I have in mind um, also for this year, people in environmental law, um, a taxation specialist, um, a specialist of uh, Israel-Palestine uh, relations. Um, there were a few more that escape uh, my mind right now, but they are also thinking about how to um, engage with Anishinaabe law in their own courses, quite aside from the development of courses specific uh, or completely devoted to Anishinaabe law. So a quick note to say that similar seeds obviously have been planted um, and are continuing to be planted in a number of other law schools and the communities they're close to or on whose territories they're located. In most places though, um, with I think I only have the exception of the University of Victoria in mind, which is devoting its whole outlook uh, to the intersection between the common law and, um, and indigenous legal traditions. In most places, this work is in very much in its infancy, and so are its ramifications and consequences for the outlook of particular law schools and for legal uh, curriculum in Canada at, uh, at large. But this is the vision I want to leave you with. There's 22 law schools, if I'm not mistaken, in Canada. If each of them takes it upon itself to intentionally and self-consciously develop and deepen relationships with the indigenous society or societies on whose land uh, it is located, toward the long-term project of increasing the familiarity of its law students uh, with their legal tradition, and doing so with a lot of care that I can talk more about if you want in the question period, what we would see emerging within a decade, perhaps two, um, are regional hubs of intersocietal legal thought and knowledge. The students coming out of uh, each of those law schools could be uniquely located and schooled um, to be valuable interlocutors for particular legal traditions in the Canadian legal landscape. And alongside the cultural references um, to one or both of the Euro-Canadian traditions, they would also possess some footing, allowing them in their careers as lawyers, negotiators, uh, mediators, and judges, of course, as well, to understand what they're being told carry themselves appropriately, respectfully, ask better questions that are relevant to their interlocutors within their own uh, frames of mind, uh, and draw on more relevant resources to solve some of the problems that they will each be presented with. The tradition-specific intersocietal dialogues that would be happening and growing uh, the body of knowledge within each of those kind of regional hubs would certainly greatly enrich the soil in which our national legal consciousness and imagination are growing. But in addition, the very fact of engaging with indigenous societies in this way, valuing the learning that comes from direct experience and that flows from interpersonal, rooted, real relationships uh, between people is already a way of implementing and experimenting with principles that are foundational in many indigenous legal traditions. It would give rise to new conventions, expectations, and ways of conceiving of ourselves that would not need to be written down in the text of our constitution to come to underlie its interpretation. Merci. Miigwech. Donc, merci euh, à la professeure euh, Boissel pour euh, vos commentaires. Uh, with the speaker's permission uh, and given time, I would uh, propose to uh, turn the micros uh, to, uh, to the audience and um, um, 
Jean will has has the micro. So if you uh, have any questions, interventions, comments, uh, please let me know, and I'll and I'll direct Jean. Uh, uh. Okay. Uh, perhaps I may start. Um, I have a um, um, question for uh, either speaker. Um, I'm very interested with the um, unwritten constitution and unwritten constitutional principles, uh, but I know very little uh, with respect to Aboriginal law and indige Indigenous law. Um, and so I'm wondering um, what lessons or ideas uh, this, um, these laws or legal systems uh, we could draw from in um, uh, uh, studying uh, and thinking about uh, matters of uh, unwritten constitutional law that uh, many of which do not perhaps have uh, um, concerned directly uh, uh, um, questions of Aboriginal law uh, or indigenous, indigenous law. And perhaps as a little aside, a more academic question, um, I um, noted that you, uh, John, referred uh, uh, to comparison once, and I'm wondering if you would call that kind of exercise uh, comparative law. Yeah, I think I would um, describe that as comparative law. One of the things that might be learned in thinking about the Canadian Constitution generally by at least looking into the Anishinaabe tradition is to understand uh, the Constitution as um, constituting, so understanding the tradition as a verb as opposed to a noun. Um, in the Anishinaabe Moen, when you speak, about 80% of your words are verbs, only 20% are nouns. And so you're always trying to talk about what are the relationship between concepts. And I would wonder what that might cause us to do if we saw our own constitution in a verb-oriented light, uh, as opposed to the categorizations that we often focus on when matters are assigned to this party or that party. Um, it, uh, you know, would help people obviously understand Anishinaabe constitution to see the verb orientation, but then reflect back on what are we doing in the Canadian context. And uh, that kind of comparison, I, like, I, you know, there's that trite saying, a fish doesn't know about water until the first time it jumps into the air. Like we swim around in water, we don't always know we're swimming around in water. We swim around in our assumptions about what constitutional law means. But when we encounter another system, it's like jumping into the air, um, and suddenly we know, oh, that thing that I was taken for granted is actually something. And so comparison is really valuable because you learn about the other, but you also then learn more about yourself uh, by the encounter of learning through that engagement with another. Um, my question would be to Professor uh, Beruth. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I might ask for some excuses because maybe I don't, I don't get what I'm going to say very well. It's, the, it's, it's, the, it's referring to the office, the theme that uh, the environment, water, um, uh, works, um, can be relationship between those those elements can become a norms and can, be, can become a source of, of law, of the rule of law eventually. And, and then now, is it a process of poetry? Is it part of development of mythology? And would you find something in the system, in the Western system of law, which, which, which provides an analogy to say that um, other than the developing of the rule of law through uh, whatever principle, you can, you can say that uh, there is some, something in, in the present system that you can provide some analogy with? 
And also the fact that now people are more aware of, uh, for instance, you know, the, the environment and things like this, would that be also part of, of this? Because see, the problem I have is how do you create that norm? How do you, well, how do you produce that norm? Yes. So um, to explain a little bit about this source of law, in Anishinaabim, when it's called akinomage, when akin is the word for earth, nomage is to point towards and then take direction from the earth. And so that source of law is developed by experience with particular landscapes, uh, animals, uh, phenomena that are encountered in the world. And, and so it's not something that you would abstract in a Platonic or Kantian or a priori way that, you know, here's the personality of this rock or plant or animals. What does that plant or rock or animal do and how does it relate to um, you know, the other things that are around it? And so through the experience of being in place, you start to reason by way of analogy from that place. So let me give you an example. Uh, in February, March each year on this landscape, the some days are really hot, some days are very cold, and you often get mists that start to rise across the land. Um, in that period, there's a kind of a flow that starts to happen with a thaw as things start to run. There's this idea of um, you know loosening up, a letting go as the snow starts to melt in that period as the, the heat's being applied on the earth. And then you get mists that rise, like I mentioned. Our word in Anishinaabemowin for that is abawa, which is kind of the word for warm and mild. But our word for forgiveness is also related to that abawa wingdom. What is forgiveness? It's when you've had a period of cold and then you start to get a loosening or a thawing or a running or um, a flow that starts to occur between uh, people after things have been kind of locked in. Um, but in order to have really forgiveness set in, you then need a long season of heat and warmth and lengthening days in order for those mists to be able to clear. So, you know, it doesn't happen in an instant that the mists are gone and that we see clearly. It, uh, it takes the kind of the change of that return of the sun to be able to complete that process. So that's an example of if in a, a legal uh, setting you were trying to figure out what your obligation was, if there's been some wrong, you would reason from the earth. Uh, you would reason from that experience of what goes on at that season, at that time on the land. And, uh, you know, and you, then you would triangulate. Right? I, I have a mantra, which is beware the danger of a single story. You don't learn about Canadian law just by hearing one story or learning one principle. You have to then put these together. And if you have then people deliberating from their different perspectives on what the land requires there, um, putting their experiences into what should happen next, uh, you start to get a legal literacy that um, reads the land. And it doesn't sound so abstract at that point and kind of out there new agey when you've you know, got uh, the practice-based element of it, not the abstract, categorized uh, nature of that. Now, is there analogies into uh, Canadian law? I think that is the most distant source of Indigenous law from Canadian law that we can find. Other sources like the deliberative or the positivistic or the customary, even the sacred, have more potential affinity, but this area of law is more distinct. It is the reason, though, that First Nations often despair if there's a clear cut of their land or a mine is put in or a species goes extinct because you suddenly expunge from the library <laughs> all of those uh, principles that are present in that relationship. And so in, in sort of taking apart a way of the natural world, you take apart uh, an element of what we learn from that that we could then not always analogize, sometimes distinguish. Where there's things that happen in nature that we don't want to do that people can also enter into liberation around. So it's connected to the environment and the reason for protecting the environment, but in, I think, a very different way. I suppose the similar, though, is that we are reasoning by way of analogy. 
and distinction. We're just looking at different sources for that. But then we're also deliberating at the end, deliberating at the end of that, which is also similar to what we do in a Western context. And in, in New Zealand right now, there's a couple of, um, like a river has legal personality now, a uh, mountaintop has legal personality, with Maori legal traditions interacting with the common law. You see in that context uh, some lessons that could be learned. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for your uh, very interesting uh, presentations and also for, for working, obviously, on, these, uh, on, these, on this subject. Um, in my experience, I work with uh, uh, Aboriginal well, First Nation and Inuit communities in Quebec. Um, and in my experience, the, perhaps the second uh, largest obstacle to recognition of legal, uh, Indigenous legal traditions after the Canadian system, you know, not recognizing them as they should, as, as you uh, underlined, um, is the fact that sometimes in communities, people don't always recognize or are not, you know, fully conscious of certain practices that are legal traditions. Uh, and so in, in, for example, I've done interviews with uh, community members, and it's, it's not always seen as a legal tradition, a certain practices that people have. Uh, and there is often a great deference towards uh, Canadian law. Um, and so with elders, obviously, uh, those who may be most knowledgeable of the language and, and of the legal traditions, um, getting older and, and a lot of elders passing away, um, I, I really feel that there's an, kind of an emergency or an urgency to gather that information and um, you know, have it passed on to the younger generation. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on uh, uh, you know, the situation in Canada today and perhaps some kind of uh, emergency measures that should be taken or if there are, I, I know that there's a big project in Ottawa uh, you know, with respect to uh, Indigenous legal traditions, uh, but if uh, you, you, know, you have any thoughts on, on that issue, taking obviously into account that it is a flexible and uh, evolutionary tradition. I'm not saying that it you know, should be frozen in how the elders see it, but there are uh, kind of certain principles that may be lost or being lost uh, as the society evolves. Yes. Um, so a couple of points here just to make generally that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has calls to action for law schools to take up this issue of uh, teaching indigenous law along with other issues dealing with indigenous peoples. The uh, 50th call to action talks about the setting up of indigenous law institutes with the funding from the federal government to be able to do this work. And uh, that would be something uh, that could help to deal with that emergency that you're talking about. Um, you're right that often elders don't call what we're doing, what they're doing, law. And, uh, and that is as it should be. There's different labels that people apply to their normative orders. Uh, but I think sometimes when they find themselves over extended period in conversation with people that do law, they start to see that there are some um, resonances uh, between the, um, the, the systems. Um, I think one of the reasons that often takes place is because law, I'm gonna say this wrong, but I hope you get the idea. The law has been stolen from us. Right, it's the Canadian government that does law, it's the parliament, it's the court that does law, and so that's what law looks like. And in the absence of us being able to make more authoritative determinations within our own normative universe, um, people don't see uh, what they do on the ground quite as strongly as law as they might if, for instance, they had constitutions and tribal courts or their fee st structure was still up and running or um, you know, they have the circles that were still more strong. So in other words, legitimacy would flow around law, I think, if there was a greater recognition that you have the authority, you have the jurisdiction to do this. And that's certainly my experience when I look at other countries. And then what you see is then there's disagreement between the elders, not that this isn't law, but what the law require here, which then leads us into um, processes 
of uh, deliberation. We have something called the Indigenous Law Research Unit at the University of Victoria, which works with the 43 communities across the country um, doing what uh, you described. And in those initial forays, they don't like to talk about it as law, but at the end, they're all over that and seeing that they have um, you know, guided ways of making decisions for regulation, dispute resolution. Um, the final point is now to put it back on the other side. If we talk to most Canadians or law students about what they think law is, again, they're going to say, well, that's what a court does or that's what a parliament does. Um, and that's right at one level. But there's all sorts of ways that we make law in more decentralized fashions that are important to how we sustain our, our legal order. And um, we don't interrogate that much in law school. And if someone came up to me and, you know, uh, I'm, I've been in this business for 25 years to try to identify law in the relationality that's in our society, it would take me some time to start to unpack that with others. I think I could eventually do it. And likewise, it's going to be the same. So in other words, this is not just saying that Indigenous people's law might have this more diffuse element that's also a part of their society, but Canadian law itself, right, civil law, common law, constitutional, whatever you're talking about, um, is relational. You can have everything on the books and enforcement, etc. but if you don't have those social structures and ways that uh, people are incentivized or have disincentives to live in accordance with the force of that order, um, we find ourselves in great difficulty, and we know countries in the world where that is more prominent than not. And so this is also a call to say, you know, we might have difficulty in the Aboriginal society to say, what is law? I think in Canada, we also have that difficulty. We've given so much over to expertise with parliaments and courts, and in fact, there's legal agency in a law professor and in a, in a lawyer. and. Uh, even in uh, someone engaging in their contractual um, you know, setting up of the rules. Uh, we, we sometimes forget that. And there needs to be ways to introduce that more fully into what we do at, in legal education. And this might be one of those ways. I would just add to this. I've, I also have had this experience. And it's, it's also connected to what John talked about in terms of being in the water and then suddenly in the air. And I think what, what you're describing is this experience of using this word or try to get to the source that you need as a lawyer to advocate on behalf of a community with its own laws but sometimes it's it's going to be a question not just of recording as you as you mentioned which is also really important and and um kind of uh drawing out uh, the principles from the knowledge held by uh, o older people as well, but also kind of um, along the lines of what John had just said, I, I would also say that using uh, the emerging scholarship that's coming from uh, indigenous uh, scholars and people working with uh, indigenous communities to, to try to make a case without having to have on the witness stand, if you will, you know, somebody who is going to put it in the words that will be recognized by a court, uh, but use maybe some of, the, some of the theories and ways of disclosing what needs to count as law, what needs to be identified and recognized as law um, in, a, in a more, like, through the practices themselves and not necessarily through the labels that are placed on them uh, might also be helpful. It just struck me that um, your task as a lawyer acting on behalf of communities, having limited time to accomplish certain goals, um, as, a, as opposed to people who can have the luxury of making it their life pursuit to kind of think about how to unpack uh, what is actually um, um, how to label as law things that are being done that people just swim in um, and will, would not label this way is, um, is, is it's important to see how uh, the task itself may be kind of tying you in a, in a knot and that there's other, uh, other practices that can help, I hope. 
Euh, merci pour euh, vos questions. Euh, notre deuxième euh, conférence euh, annuelle euh, Chevrette-Marx euh, tire à sa fin. Euh, J'aimerais maintenant euh, vous inviter euh, à notre vin d'honneur qui euh, se déroulera juste à quelques pas euh, d'ici euh, au salon euh, François Chevret du pavillon euh, Maximilien euh, Caron. Euh, je terminerai euh, en vous euh, mentionnant que euh, les euh, euh, travaux des conférences Chevrette Marx sont publiés euh, chaque année euh, et euh, je souligne que euh, la euh, conférence euh, inaugurale de l'an dernier est maintenant publiée depuis euh, hier soir. Alors euh, en primeur, elle est disponible euh, euh, pour vous, euh, juste à, à l'entrée euh, euh, du, euh, du salon. Alors, je vous invite à y jeter un coup d'œil et surtout euh, à l'acheter. Euh, en terminant, euh, j'aimerais vous remercier d'être euh, présent euh, euh, ce soir. Euh, j'aimerais euh, 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 dire un merci spécial à notre traductrice, euh, euh, Madame euh, Danielle euh, Laroche. Et euh, bien sûr, euh, j'espère que euh, je vous invite à vous joindre à moi pour euh, remercier une, une dernière fois nos deux euh, speakers de ce soir. Merci beaucoup. Excusez-moi. Hey, je... Daniel, Daniel euh, tu n'es pas obligé de traduire ça. Là. Mais c'est trop intéressant. Puis je me dis... Une façon de démystifier, moi, que j'ai découverte à l'occasion du camp, une façon de démystifier l'apport la, que peut, euh, que peut euh, avoir une, une tradition juridique autochtone, c'est de, de tenter de réaliser que ce que les juges font, particulièrement en, en commun, c'est beaucoup un travail de nous conter une histoire, où le juge, au fond, à partir de l'histoire qu'il nous compte et des faits qu'il sélectionne, va dégager les principes. L'exercice qu'on a fait en fin de semaine, pensez à la, au renvoi sur la cessation, parce qu'il y a quelque chose de plus canadien que ça. Mais le renvoi sur la cessation, qu'est-ce que c'est? C'est essentiellement une histoire du Canada élaborée par les juges, une histoire qui n'est pas toute la vérité, mais qui est une vérité, dont on peut débattre, et à partir de laquelle, qu'est-ce que les juges font? Ils ignorent le texte de la Constitution complètement, pour dégager des principes non écrits, à partir desquels, et des principes qui existent en symbiose les uns avec les autres, aucun des deux peut en écarter un autre, et il dégage un principe normatif. What we did this weekend, resorting to indigenous legal stories, and more than one, as John said, there's, just, there's not just one story, is basically the very same thing, and I intend to do that with my students. It's just that it feels uncomfortable because we're dealing with a document that's out of, outside of our culture. And I don't pretend to know anything about indigenous legal orders. But I think in a, in a small way, we can try resorting to this and make our students understand that what appears so foreign is basically a practice, as you also, also often say, more than concept. And even concepts such as sovereignty, we talk about sovereignty as something we can put on the end of the table, but it's not a capital, it's not a form of capital, it's a relationship. And same goes for freedom. It's not a space where I'm alone. My freedom depends on the relationship I have with the other one inside, in front of me. So I think we have, on doit se démystifier ces choses-là. Merci beaucoup et je m'excuse de... <laughs>